Welcome to Philosophy 1301, Introduction to Philosophy. My name is Ryan Pollock, and I will be your instructor for this course. In this first video, I will cover some of the basic things you need to know about the class. This includes where to find the syllabus and how to use the course schedule, what we will learn about in this class, the class learning format, how the material will be covered, and the various assignments that you will complete throughout the course of the semester. Before we begin, however, there's one preliminary point that I need to make about this video. The video you are about to watch was originally made with the syllabus and Blackboard page for a section of this class designed to be taught in the fall of 2021. This means that if you are not taking this class in the fall of 2021, then some of the specific information you will see on the syllabus and the course schedule such as the dates of the class and the due dates for the assignments, may not apply to you specifically. However, all the general explanations I give in this video about how the class will function will still apply to you and your particular section. In order to find out the precise information that applies to your specific section of the class, you should consult the syllabus that is posted to the Blackboard page for our course. To get started, you will first need to know how to locate the syllabus. You can find the syllabus in the area of our Blackboard page entitled Syllabus and Course Resources. The syllabus for our class will be the first document listed here along with the response paper guidelines and the study guides for the exams. My focus in this video will largely be to cover the material that is contained in the syllabus. You can see at the top of the first page of the syllabus that I've listed my contact information. Now before I get into the specifics of how to contact me, I first want to say that I understand there are various challenges associated with online learning. Chief among these is that it can be easy to feel alienated from the course, your instructor, and your other peer students in the class. For this reason, I want to emphasize that there really is an actual flesh and blood person teaching this class, namely me, and that I will be present in the class and want to make myself available to address any concerns you may have. So, if you have questions about anything at any time during this class, then the best way to get in touch with me is through email. You can see that my listed email address is rpollock at tamusa.edu. In addition, I am also available for virtual office hour meetings. If you would like to meet with me, then please first send me an email and we can arrange a time. Following this, we can meet through Blackboard Collaborate. Once we've established a time to meet, I will set up a meeting room using this tool. In order to find Blackboard Collaborate, first click on the Tools area of Blackboard. Then, scroll down and click on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Here, you will be able to find the meeting room that I will have set up for our virtual office hour meeting. The next portion of the syllabus provides a general overview of what philosophy is about and briefly describes what we will be learning about in this class. I will not go into too much detail about this at present, since I hope this will become more clear as we proceed throughout the semester. However, I do want to say a few things about what you should expect to learn this semester, and also give you an idea of why I believe that the opportunity this class provides for you to study philosophy is both valuable and worthwhile. And I will take up this task in the next section of this video. The following is a non-exhaustive list of questions you could expect to encounter in an introductory course in philosophy. Does God exist? What is it that makes me who I am? Is it possible for a person to survive their own death? Is death even bad for the one who dies? What is the meaning of life? What does it mean to live a good life? Where does morality come from? 
Do human beings have free will, and can we be responsible for our actions? Now, you may notice that these questions cover a variety of different topics, but one thing that unites them is the following. They are all quite abstract, and it may seem at first glance that they don't have very much to do with our ordinary lives. In fact, we might imagine someone who levels the following objection to thinking about these questions at all. Perhaps this person would say, It is all fine and well to sit around contemplating the meaning of life or the nature of morality, but what impact will that have on the life I live? After all, I have much more pressing concerns like securing a good-paying job, making sure my kids can go to college, and taking care of my aging parents. Who has time to contemplate the meaning of life or what happens after we die? I will just let those with too much time on their hands handle these abstract existential questions. It is no doubt true that the immediate practical concerns of our lives do demand and should demand our attention. However, my hope is that through this class you may come to recognize that as human beings, we cannot live a full, flourishing life through focusing on practical, immediate, utilitarian concerns alone. Rather, the ability to think philosophically about seemingly abstract questions has real implications for how we live our lives and for what kind of persons we ultimately become. In the course description section of the syllabus, there is an epigraph which comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. It is actually a quote which Plato attributed to his teacher Socrates. And Socrates tells us here that, I say it's the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day on the grounds that the unexamined life isn't worth living. This famous statement is important for us because we will return to it later in the class when we discuss Plato's famous dialogue, The Apology. However, beyond this, it also has a broader importance for what I hope to accomplish in this class, and for that reason, it is worth thinking about it a little further. There are a number of claims packed into this statement. There is the implication that, as human beings, we should live an examined life. In fact, it is our responsibility as a human being to live such a life, a responsibility that presumably does not obtain for other types of beings. Furthermore, we are told that those who live unexamined lives fail to lead a life that is worth living. If that is true, then it would be of the utmost importance to have a good grasp on what it means to live an examined life and what it means to lead an unexamined life. After all, no person who is near death would want to look back on their life and discover to themselves that it wasn't worth living. So, what does it mean to live an examined life? Here it might be helpful to think about the various ways in which human beings decide what to believe, decide what they think is true. Human beings have beliefs that pertain to a wide variety of topics, Morality, politics, human nature, the structure and origin of the universe, and how to live a happy life. These beliefs also have many sources. A person might believe what they do because of tradition, authority, how they were educated, because they were never exposed to alternate ways of thinking, or simply because believing a certain thing makes them feel good. Yet the person who lives an examined life forms their beliefs in a way that is significantly different from each of these. Living an examined life means not just forming our view of the world based upon our personal instincts, preferences, or the teachings of our particular community. Rather, this sort of life requires the commitment to forming our beliefs through reason and critical thinking. As we will see, philosophers discuss many questions of deep human importance, And the philosopher does not, or at least should not, accept a belief as true merely because it is a piece of social, cultural, religious, or personal dogma. This commitment to self-examination requires the willingness to subject what we believe to critical questioning and an effort to discover the truth. And if Plato is right, then this is an essential component of what it means to live a flourishing human life. 
No matter how much contentment is gained from steadfastly refusing to examine our beliefs and from remaining in a state of ignorance, this way of living simply never can qualify as a life that is worthy of a human being. So, this returns us to the original question. Why concern oneself with thinking about the abstract kinds of questions that philosophers are apt to think about? In part, it is because to live an unexamined life where we fail to do this is to live a life in which we do not take advantage of the higher capacities that human beings have for reason and reflection, the capacities that make human beings distinctive and make us what we are. And to that extent, the unexamined life is simply an impoverished form of human existence. In addition, try as we might, it is very unlikely that we will be able to go through our lives completely avoiding the kinds of questions that philosophers ask. No matter what you think about the existence of God, for example, it is likely that you will at some point encounter someone who takes the opposite position, and you will need to know how to contend with that fact somehow. Or you can only work at a job doing the same thing for so many years or undertake your daily routine for so long until you naturally begin to wonder whether there is any purpose or perhaps even any ultimate purpose to what it is you are doing on a daily basis. Furthermore, if it is not already done so, at some point the realization that life is finite, that life comes to an end and that you will die will become something you are forced to think about. Again, no matter how long we attempt to act as if this is not the case. And when that happens, a whole host of difficult questions are sure to follow. Is the fact that we die a bad thing? If in the end we are doomed to die, then is there any real point in living? Does the fact that we die actually make the time we have in our life more meaningful? and give it a greater degree of importance? Does anything happen to us after death? If so, is that the sort of existence that you would want to have? The point here is that whether we like it or not, the need to examine our lives can either be taken up voluntarily and courageously, or it can be foisted upon us like an unwelcome house guest. But in either case, there is no real escaping it. One of the burdens of having the higher mental capacities and ability for reflection that characterizes human beings is that we will be forced to use them at some point. I hope then that you see this class as a rare opportunity to think seriously about many interesting, difficult, and important questions. Questions which the ordinary practical demands of our lives often prevent us from treating with the seriousness and attention that they deserve. Now that we have a sense of the subject matter of this class, we need to discuss the learning format and how learning will take place. On the syllabus, it says that this class is taught in an online, asynchronous learning format. But what does this mean? Well, because this class is taught online, everything will happen virtually through our course Blackboard page. There will never be any face-to-face physical class meetings. Furthermore, When we say that this class is asynchronous, this means that there will not be any virtual class meetings either. That is, there will not be a scheduled time each week where we will all meet with one another on Blackboard Collaborate or Zoom or some other platform. Instead, there will be a set number of tasks that you need to complete each week, and those tasks will have deadlines. But you will get to choose within the structures of those deadlines when precisely you complete all those tasks. For example, each week there will be a number of pre-recorded lecture videos that you are required to watch. However, you will not be required to watch these at any particular time during the week. You will get to choose when doing so works best with your particular schedule. So, in this learning format, there are deadlines that assignments must be submitted by, but there's also considerable flexibility for students in terms of where and when learning takes place. So what tasks are you required to complete each week? 
For most weeks, your tasks include completing the readings, watching the lecture videos, and submitting the required assignments. Furthermore, the exact things that you need to do will be described in two different areas. First, you can find this information in the course schedule of the syllabus. In addition, you can also find this information in the weekly instruction documents that I email every Monday and which are also posted on Blackboard. Now let's begin by saying a few things about the readings. Where can you find the required readings? As stated here on the syllabus, there is no textbook you are required to purchase for this class. All readings are made available through Blackboard. Furthermore, you can see what you need to read by consulting the course schedule, which can be found in the last section of the syllabus. Currently, you are looking at the area for week two of the class. On the right-hand side of this box, there's a heading entitled Reading, and there it tells us that there is one reading you are required to complete this week, and that reading is the Value of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. Now, where can you find the readings for this class? To find these readings and all the other content for the class, begin by clicking on the Course Content area of Blackboard. Here you will see that there is a separate folder for each week of the class. In this case, we are looking for the readings for week 2, so let's click on the folder for week 2. Then, by scrolling down, we can find the item labeled Reading, Russell, The Value of Philosophy. Your assignment in week 2 would be to read the entirety of this document. In some cases, there may be more than one reading to complete. For example, in week four, there are two assigned readings, one by Christopher Pines and one by Andrew Forsymes. So you will be required to complete both of these readings. Unless some indication is given otherwise, you are required to read the entire document that is linked on Blackboard. However, in some cases, I have indicated that you are only required to read a portion of that document. Week 5 provides an example of this. In this case, there is one assigned reading, Plato's Euthyphro, and you can see here that you are only required to read pages 2 through 11. In addition, in some cases there will be a reading that is listed as optional. For example, in week 11 there is one required reading, The Phaedo by Plato, pages 60 to 73, but there is also an optional reading and that is Plato on the Immortality of the Soul by Kagan, pages 76 to 97. Now, I will refer to the optional readings in my lectures, and by completing them, you can gain greater understanding of the material. However, if you are short on time, then the optional readings would be those you might choose to skip in order to focus your time and energy elsewhere. Once you have completed the reading for the week, the next step should be to watch the lecture videos that I have created to explain the content from the readings. Again, we will take week two of the class as an example. After reading the selection from Russell, you are required to watch lecture videos three, four, and five. You can access these videos in two ways. First, you can watch the videos by using the links on the syllabus. For example, if you wanted to watch lecture three, then I could simply click on the link provided here. This link will take you to YouTube, which is where you will watch all of the lecture videos. There are a few points to make about the lectures. The first of these is that you will want to make sure that you complete the readings before watching the lectures. The lectures do explain the content of the readings, in addition to expanding upon them and providing further context and discussion, but they explain the readings in a way that presupposes you are already at least somewhat familiar with what is in the text. 
So you will get the most out of the lectures and the lectures will make the most sense to you if you have already done the reading first. The second point deals with the format of the lectures themselves. As you can see from the lecture currently playing on your screen, the lectures consist of myself talking over a PDF document that I use as a visual aid. When it comes time to, for example, study for exams, you may find it useful to have access to this PDF document. One way that you can access it is through the description section of the YouTube video. This will give you access to all of the visuals that I use in my lectures, and from here you would be able to save the document to your computer and or print it out as you wish. You can also access the lectures directly from Blackboard. For lecture three, we would first enter the course content area. Then open the folder for week two. Following this, we can then find lecture three by scrolling down in the week two area of the class. In addition, you can also access the PDF document I use in my lectures directly through Blackboard by clicking on the document link that is attached to the video. The next section of the syllabus discusses the assignments that you are required to complete in this class. There are three assignment categories here. First, the weekly assignments, which are comprised of the discussion forums and quizzes. Then there are the response papers, and finally, the exams. I'm not going to say too much about these assignments in this particular video. That is because I go into much more detail about these in subsequent videos. There is one video on the weekly assignments, an entire week's worth of videos on the response papers, and then finally one video on the exams. However, there are a few points that I want to make about the assignments at this time. First, how do I know when a given assignment is due? You can find this information on the course schedule of the syllabus. Let's look at a few examples here to understand this. For instance, consider week one of the class. For each week of the class, you can find the assignments you need to complete under the assignments heading of the course schedule. Here we see that discussion forum one and quiz one are both due during this week. In week four, to take another example, we can see that discussion forum three and response paper one are due. And to consider one final example, the course schedule shows that exam one is due during week nine. Now, I will say a few things about each type of assignment. Again, this will be rather brief and more details about these specific assignments will be explained in subsequent videos. However, let's begin with the weekly assignments category. Again, this category includes both discussion forums and quizzes. The content of the quizzes will depend on the quiz in question, and that will be explained on the course schedule of the syllabus. However, it may be useful to say something further about what to expect from the discussion forum. The purpose of the discussion forum is to allow you to discuss the material further by interacting with both your fellow classmates as well as the instructor. For each week of the class that has a discussion forum, which generally speaking is every week of the class except for the weeks during which you take an exam, you will be required to make three total posts. One of those posts is called a first post and is due by the end of the day on Thursday. In this post, you will be responding directly to a prompt about that week's material. The other two posts, the response posts, 
are posts in response to what has been said by other people, either your other uh, fellow classmates or the instructor. There is, of course, much more to say here about how to participate in the discussion forums and how you will be graded on your participation, but those points will be saved for a later video. The response papers will require you in at least 600 words to first explain an argument from the reading and then to criticize that argument. There are eight opportunities to complete response papers throughout the course of the semester, but you are only actually required to do four of these papers, and in fact, you are not permitted to do any more than four. However, this flexibility in choosing which papers you will complete comes with the following caveats. You must complete response paper one, and then you must complete at least one paper out of the group of response paper two, response paper three, and response paper four. There is much more to say about the response papers, but I will not do that here because later in the class, an entire week will be devoted to explaining how to write a philosophy paper. As you can see here, during this week, there will be four lectures that explain the response paper assignments. This week will then culminate in you completing your first response paper, response paper one, which you will recall all students are required to complete. The final type of assignment in this class is the exam. There are two exams in this class, exam one and exam two. Exam one covers material in the first half of the course, while exam two covers material in the second half of the course. This means that exam two is not cumulative. There will be one week of the class devoted to each of the exams. Again, for the exact dates for the exams or any other assignment that is associated with your particular section of the class, please consult the course schedule posted to Blackboard. However, in this specific case, we can see that exam one will take place during week nine. And we can also see that exam two will take place during week 17. As with the weekly assignments and the response papers, I will wait to explain most of the details about how to prepare for the exams, how you will take the exams, and how I will grade the exams until a later video that is devoted specifically to the exam assignments. However, there is one thing I want to make sure you are aware of right from the beginning. The format of each exam will be the following you will be required to submit a written response to two essay prompts that pertain to the course material. The prompts you will be required to answer will be randomly selected from a list of essays that you can find on the exam study guides. There are two places in which you can find these exam study guides. First, you can find these study guides in the syllabus and course resources area of Blackboard. You can also find the exam study guides in the areas of the course specifically devoted to exam 1 and exam 2, respectively. You will notice that in the case of both of the study guides, the study guide for exam one and the study guide for exam two, each has a complete list of possible essay questions you could see on the exam. The list of essay questions you see here 
is the exact list, word for word, from which the two questions you will be required to answer will be selected. So what does this mean? It means that you can begin preparing for the exams very early. In fact, I would suggest checking back to the study guides regularly, perhaps at the end of each week, to see if we have covered the material from any of the questions. Then, I would recommend going ahead and beginning to work on writing out your responses. There are two advantages to doing this. First, by doing this, you will begin working on your responses to the questions when the material is most fresh in your mind. Second, if you begin working on your responses early, then you can have a rough draft of all your responses ready by the time we get to exam week. That means during that week, you would only need to proofread your essays and expand upon points that could or need to be explained further. This will make exam week much less stressful and very likely also improve the quality of your answers. Finally, I want to emphasize, and I will emphasize this again in the video that specifically discusses exams, that it will be vital for you to have your responses to all the essay prompts completely written out before starting the exam program. That is because once you open the program, you will only have 20 minutes to submit your answers. And 20 minutes will certainly not be enough time to completely answer the essay prompts. And in fact, the entire point of setting it up this way is just to make it so that you have to have your answers written out in advance. Therefore, it is very much to your advantage and in fact even crucially necessary that you begin to work on your responses well prior to you actually opening up the exam program and submitting your exam. For now, that will suffice in terms of explanation of the exam assignments. More will be said later in a subsequent video that focuses specifically on guidelines and requirements for the exams. To close this video, I will say a few things about how your grade will be calculated, and I will offer a few thoughts on my overall approach to grading. Your final grade in this class will be calculated according to the following percentages. The weekly assignments, which includes the discussions and the quizzes combined, will be worth 25% of your grade. The four response papers combined will be worth also 25% of your grade, and then each exam independently will be worth 25% of your grade. Your grade will then be converted into a final letter based upon the grading scale that you see on your screen. A 90% and above would be an A, 80 to 89% is a B, etc. It may happen that at the end of the semester, you have a grade that is close to being in the next highest grade bracket. For example, Suppose at the end of the semester you had an 88% or maybe a 79%. Would I consider bumping your grade up to an A or B respectively? I do consider doing this based upon your participation in the class. If a student is within two percentage points of the next highest grade bracket and has made consistent and substantial contributions to the class in terms of participation, then I would consider raising that student's grade to the next highest letter. But you might ask, this is an online class, so what does it mean to participate in this context? What participation largely refers to is your engagement in the discussion forums. If you consistently make substantive contributions to the discussions that actively seek to push the discussion forward in new and interesting ways, then you would be a prime candidate to have a borderline grade raised to the next highest letter at the end of the semester. However, this is not the only thing I take into account when thinking about your participation. Participation can also take the form of reaching out for help to the instructor when necessary, taking an active interest in your learning, and showing consistent improvement over the course of the semester. This last point in particular 
applies to the response paper assignments. Students who make clear improvement on their work over the semester will also be candidates for having their borderline grades increased. Suppose you miss an assignment or a deadline. For example, maybe you missed the deadline for one of the required response papers or you were not able to turn in one of the exams on time. Will it be possible to make up that assignment? It will be possible in some cases, provided the student has an excused reason for missing the assignment. In order for some reason to qualify as an excused reason, the following two conditions must be met. First, the student must notify the instructor no later than 24 hours after the deadline of the missed assignment has passed. So, for example, suppose you missed the Friday night deadline for one of the exams. In order to meet this condition, you would have to inform me via email that you missed the assignment no later than by the end of the day on Saturday. Second, the student must also have a reason for missing the assignment that the instructor finds excusable. An example of a reason the instructor is likely to find excusable is something like a death in the family, illness, or some other sort of emergency. An example of a reason the instructor would not find excusable is that the student simply overslept or forgot about the assignment. In the case that a student does have an excused reason for missing some assignment, then other arrangements can be made for making up that work. Finally, and speaking more generally, the most important thing to keep in mind here is that if you run into any difficulties, you should really not hesitate to contact me. I am willing to be flexible and accommodating for students who are willing to be upfront and communicate about what is going on in their personal situation. Finally, I think it is important for me to say a few things about grading. It is not an uncommon reaction for students to find this class to be more difficult than they anticipated. To some extent, this should not be surprising. Philosophy is a difficult subject. The ideas can at times be difficult to grasp at first until we take the time to think about them carefully. And demonstrating your understanding of these ideas requires the ability to communicate clearly through writing, which is a skill that must be practiced and learned. So I would not say that I am a hard grader exactly, but I do strive to make sure that the grade a student receives accurately reflects the quality and accuracy of their work. So this means you should not expect to receive an excellent grade if you do not demonstrate excellent understanding of the material. And at times in philosophy, especially for beginners, it can be difficult to demonstrate excellent understanding. Now to further illustrate this point, consider what attitude it would be rational to have toward getting a C on some assignment. It seems that it is becoming increasingly more common to perceive a C grade as a failing grade, but of course that is not true. A C grade is really meant to convey average performance. Certainly, if the student got a C, then the student did not excel or even really do what I would qualify as a good job. I would think of that as B-level work. But the student did not completely miss the mark either. So especially early in the class, if you receive a C on an assignment, your takeaway should not be that you failed, but your takeaway should be that you were grappling with difficult material and that you had an average performance and that in this case there is room to improve as the semester goes on. What this entails is that if you want to receive an excellent grade in this class, if you want to receive an A, then you will have to demonstrate mastery of the material. When I grade your assignments, I do not begin from the starting assumption that the student necessarily understands the material. I look for evidence from the student's work that he or she understands it. So in order to receive an A, a student will need to make it inescapably clear to me that he or she has a high level understanding of the relevant concepts, ideas, and arguments. It may also be useful to address some of the root causes for why students sometimes enter this course thinking that it will be easy. Sometimes it is assumed that this class must be easy because it is an introductory level class. 
But all the idea of introductory means is that it introduces the most basic concepts of the discipline, the first things one should know before studying that discipline further. That doesn't necessarily mean those concepts will be simple or easy. For example, nobody would assume that a class entitled Introduction to Astrophysics or Introduction to Quantum Mechanics would be an easy class. It is also sometimes assumed that this class will be easy because it is a general education course. However, there's nothing about the concept of general education that implies the class will be easy either. General education simply means a kind of education that is not tailored specifically towards some practical outcome or career path. It is the type of education you undergo to become a more well-rounded person who is familiar with subjects like art, history, literature, and of course, philosophy. You do not necessarily study these subjects because you want to make a career out of them, although making a career out of them is possible, but because a well-educated citizen who is capable of thinking critically and understanding the broader cultural context in which she is placed needs some understanding of these things. So, general education just denotes an education whose value cannot be reduced to practical utility. But again, nothing in that means that such an education will be simple or easy. Now, I do not say any of this to scare you, but only to give you a realistic sense of what to expect in this class. While I do hold a high standard of grading and evaluation, I also want to do whatever I can to help enable you to meet that standard. So if you have questions about the material, want to improve your work, or need help or clarification about any other facet of the class, then I do encourage you to contact me and I will always be happy to assist you.